if Christians would learn this one thing, if Christians would learn this one thing, it would change the world of apologetics and would change the entire dynamic between Christians and Muslims in the entire world. So you've got a PhD in philosophy from Fordham University. Mm -hmm. um, and up there you studied the problem of evil. Since then you have debated on God's existence. You have debated on the resurrection of Jesus, a number of different issues. I mean, you're one of the smartest people I've ever met. Uh, this is true. Yeah. <laughs> Not the humblest. <laughs> um, now you specialize in Islam. What's some of your favorite art? Do you have a favorite argument? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, and I have, I, I mean, I have several, you know, I, I, I should make a list of like my favorite arguments uh, dealing with Islam. But uh, there's one that's kind of above everything else, because if, if Christians, in fact, if I could change one thing in the world of apologetics, it would be getting Christians to understand what the Quran says about the Jewish and Christian scriptures. So the Bible, the Torah and the gospel, because if Christians would learn that, it changes everything. Right now, what we have in the world is um, in discussions about Christianity and Islam, discussions between Christians and Muslims, the Muslim is usually on the offensive and the Christian is usually on the defensive. So mm -hmm. the Muslim is raising objections. Um, he's saying, your Bible's been corrupted. Uh, Jesus never claimed to be God. Jesus never died on the cross. Um, the Trinity doesn't make sense. And the Christians are trying to defend their religion against criticism. Um, and, and Christians are rarely on the offense of going after, you know, the Quran or whether Muhammad is a prophet and so on, just because uh, Muslims are, are, are frequently raised to have objections against Christianity, whereas Christians generally aren't raised to have objections towards, towards Islam. So, uh, but at the same time, there are um, you know, lots of Christians who wouldn't be comfortable raising bringing up problems with Muhammad or problems with Muhammad's character, things like that. They don't want to upset Muslims. And so uh, there's one area that's sort of, it's going to come up because the Muslim is going to bring it up. And yet it's within the realm of discussing, you know, the Bible, but it's simultaneously a massive problem for Islam. And we call it, uh, we call it the Islamic dilemma. Uh, a dilemma is you can go this way or you can go that way, but either way you're in trouble, right? And that's what, that's the problem that Muslims face. Now notice, Muslims don't say that our Bible was never the word of God. They say it's been corrupted. And the reason they say it's been corrupted is that they know that according to their sources, according to their prophet, scriptures are revealed to um, to the Jews and scriptures were revealed uh, through Jesus and through his through his followers So they know this and the Quran in Surah 3 verses 3 to 4 Says that Allah revealed the Torah and the gospel And so there are passages like that in the Quran talking about Allah being the one who revealed the Torah and the gospel uh, Now when it says the gospel or the Injil, uh -huh. how do we know that that's referring to? our gospels rather than the message of the gospel well because uh i mean you could because i mean we use gospel in the same way right we can use it to refer to a message that's spoken yeah and we can use it to refer to a text that we're reading um but uh, surah 7 verse 157 of the quran talks about jews and christians who are reading the torah and the gospel during oh, okay. the time of muhammad okay during the time of muhammad and finding him mentioned in our scriptures so this is talking about the text and not, not just the text, it's talking about texts that have been preserved since the first century. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what texts do Christians have in the seventh century that's, that's been preserved uh, since the first century? Notice this already, just by knowing that, this already rules out a lot of Muslim objections saying that the apostle Paul corrupted Christianity mm -hmm. or saying that the, the Bible was changed at the Council of Nicaea. Mm -hmm. Talking the seventh century, Muhammad's walking around saying that Christians and Jews still have the Torah and the gospel, right? But basically here's the situation. Um, Muhammad revealed through the Quran that the Torah and the gospel were the word of God. Muslims know that, but over time, Muslims went to the Torah and the gospel and realized they don't line up with Islam. And so they were forced to conclude, well, our scriptures must have been corrupted because they're inspired, but they don't line up with Islam. Now, the conclusion that they should have drawn is, 
these texts don't say what Muhammad said that they say, therefore we're dealing with a false prophet. But by the time they realized what the Torah and the gospel say, you are in no position to say Muhammad is a false prophet, you get your head chopped off. Mm -hmm. So they had to just modify their position. But here's the problem. The Quran does not simply say that Allah initially inspired the Torah and the gospel, but that they were af uh, you know, afterwards corrupted. That's what Muslims think that the, the, the Quran says. The Quran affirms not only the inspiration, but also the preservation and the authority of Jewish and Christian scriptures. At Let least through the seventh century. <clears throat> yes, absolutely. Or the beginning of the seventh yeah, century. Yeah, but here's the thing. We know what the Bible of the seventh century says. That's right. Because right? we have copies of it before that. That's right. So we know what it says. And so here's the problem, right? And just let me give some passages for people to uh, to read. So I mentioned Surah 3, verses 3 to 4. That mentions the uh, inspiration of the Torah and the gospel. I mentioned Surah 7, verse 157, which says that people were still reading it during the time of Muhammad. Um, you stopping? No. Oh, okay. Um, I thought you were. <laughs> We got uh, Surah 7, verse 157, which says, you know, Christians and Jews were still reading the gospel and the Torah during the time of Muhammad. Um, we've got passages, multiple passages in the Quran, which say that no one can change Allah's words. Surah 18, verse 27 of the Quran, Surah 6, verse 115, say that no one can change Allah's words. And Muslims will look at that and say, ah, well, that just means his words in the Quran. That's not what it says. It mm -hmm. says no one can change his words. That's why you're supposed to trust the Quran, because no one can change his words. Well, based on what Muslims are telling me, people change Allah's words all the time, right? Jews change it, Christians change it, everyone changed it, right? So what? So is Allah lying there? Is he, is he making something up? So you have these kinds of passages, and then things get really interesting. You get to Surah 5 of the Quran, chapter 5, verse 43 of the Quran. Some Jews come to Muhammad to judge a dispute they were having. And Allah's response to Muhammad is, why are the Jews coming to you when they have their Torah? Right? So notice, if the Torah has been corrupted, that makes no sense. It should have been, it's a good thing the Jews are coming to you since their book is corrupted. But he doesn't. He says, they don't need you, Muhammad. They've got the Torah. Hmm. A few verses later, Allah says, hmm. let, the Christian, let the people of the gospel, the people of the gospel judge by what Allah has revealed therein. And if we fail to judge by the light of what Allah has revealed in the gospel, we are rebels against him. Right? So notice, notice the difference between what Muslims say and what the Quran says. The Quran says, if we do not judge by the gospel, we are rebels against Allah. Muslims say, don't judge by the gospel, it's been corrupted. They're saying the exact opposite of what their God says. So we've got chapter 5, verse 43, chapter 5, verse 47, and then the verse after that, chapter 5, verse 48, says that Muslims judge by the Quran. The picture that you actually get from reading the Quran is that prophets have gone out into all the world and different prophets have revealed different revelations and that the people need to use the revelation that was real, revealed to their people in their language, right? So that's the position of the Quran. Al Muhammad is called the seal of the prophets. He's the final prophet because the Arabs were the last people to get the revelation. Everyone else already had their book. So when you read it, it's you Jews, you judge by the Torah. You Christians, you judge by the gospel. Us Muslims, we're supposed to judge by the Quran. And so that's the position of the Quran. And even later in Surah 5, verse 68, Allah says um, that Christians and Jews, people of the book, have no ground to stand upon unless we stand upon the Torah, the gospel, and all the revelation that has come to us. So it's commanding us. We have no ground to stand upon unless we stand upon our revelations. What mm -hmm. do Muslims say? They say, oh no, your revelations have been corrupted. Why? Because they realize that our revelations don't line up with theirs. So we know that Allah affirms the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of our scriptures. That puts Muslims in a dilemma because there are two possibilities here. Either we have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, or we don't, we got something that's corrupted. If we have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, Islam is false because Islam contradicts our book on basic doctrines like the death of Jesus, the deity of Christ, things like that. So if we have the word of God, Islam is false. If we don't have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, Islam is false because the Quran affirms the inspiration, preservation, authority of our book. So if, if the Bible's the word of God, Islam is false. If the Bible's not the word of God, Islam is false. Either way, Islam is false. And that's why when, why when Muslims bring an objection to Christians and say, your Bible's been corrupted, you can flip it right back and say, really? It's been corrupted? Well, you got a problem because Allah says otherwise, and you can bring up this dilemma. And that's why it's simultaneously a block of their objection and a critique of their prophet in their book.
reminds me of the Islamic Catch-22 argument that I give about Jesus' crucifixion and whether he died. Um, so thanks for copying that uh, from me. No, uh, what, what you can actually take this and you can put, you can make all kinds of dilemmas, right? Yeah. You can make all, you can show any verse in the Bible that disagrees with something that Islam teaches and put it in dilemma form, right? So you can show where Jesus calls himself the son of God or where he says that yeah. he's going to be a ransom for, for mankind. And guess what? If <laughs> there's two possibilities, either either said that or he didn't. If he said that, then Islam is false. If he didn't say that, then Islam is false for, for, for affirming that book and, and for affirming the inspiration, the preservation of authority of that book. So either way, Islam just turns out to be false. And so you can take any issue, wherever the Muslim objects, go back to the Islamic dilemma and he's got a problem. Well, I've often heard it said that there are two kinds of people in this world. <laughs> those who divide the world into two kinds of people and those who don't. I thought you were going to say those with bullets in their guns and those who dig. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there are two kinds of people in this world. Those with loaded guns and those who dig. You, you dig. dig. <laughs> um, so, what's that from? The good, bad, and the ugly, yep, right? Yep. Uh -huh. um, all right. Have you ever thrown that, uh, given that argument to a Muslim? I'm sure you have. What, oh, yeah. What's been the response? Uh, well, I mean, there, there are some people who actually end up converting to Christianity based on uh, that kind of argument. Uh, Abdul Murray. Mm. Abdul Murray converted, not because we gave it to him. No, I thought I mean, it was he, a resurrection, he, he, right? He went, he went through the same reasoning, namely that the Quran keeps telling me to go to, the, to go to this other book, that this other book is Revelation, and this led him to, to the Bible, right? But uh, they, they, the only thing they can do, the only real response is uh, they, they, they have to say it's referring to some other gospel, right? One that we don't have. But as soon as they do that, they're, they're telling, you know, the, the, the next God step is to preserve point out, it. Yeah. The next step is to point out that they're, they're basically calling Allah the worst communicator in the world, right? I tell them, I said, wait a minute, you're telling me Allah comes and he tells us, Christians, you judge by the gospel, knowing that we're going to assume that he means the gospel that we actually have and not some gospel that we don't have. <laughs> and he walks away. I said, just imagine someone comes to you and says, you Muslims, you judge by the Quran and then leaves. And then, you know, centuries later, you find out, oh, I wasn't talking about the Quran you have. I was talking about some Quran you don't have. You'd be the worst communicator ever, right? So you point out those kinds of things. They'll also, it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of silly, but they'll also take verses of the Quran, completely distort their meaning to make it sound like it's, it's talking about the, the corruption of the Bible. So there are verses in the Quran that they'll twist and make, make it sound like it's talking about the corruption of the Bible. All you have to do is read the passage, look at the historical background. The Quran does nothing but affirm the inspiration and the preservation and authority of our text. And Muslims, show me one word critical of the gospel that is in our possession. Show me one word in the Quran that's critical of the gospel in our possession. Wow. Well, you've heard David Wood on this and uh, man, he's just a remarkable guy and God's using him in amazing ways. So, hey, someone wants to get, they, they want to see your stuff. Of course, you go to YouTube and you type in David Wood, you can see his YouTube channel. Anything else? That's it. I mean, uh, the, it, they can find other stuff uh, in the, you know, if they click on a video, they can always go to the description box. It'll have websites and other things. Man. Well, thanks for joining us for mm -hmm. these. And uh, hey, thanks a lot yep. for sharing with us, brother. Yeah, no problem. Appreciate you, man.